All right, well, over the course of 35 days, jurors heard from no less than 72 witnesses. The one person they did not hear from was Whitey Bulger himself, as he declined to testify. After the verdict, defense attorney Jay Carney spoke for Bulger, saying he was pleased with the outcome. It was important to him uh, that the government corruption be exposed and important to him that people see firsthand the deals that the government was able to make with certain people. And now Hank Brennan, a member of Whitey Bulger's defense team, is here. Welcome, Hank Brennan. Thank you for it's having me. It's been a me. wild eight, ten weeks for you. It's been a busy year and a half. <laughs> How did your client respond today? We just heard Jay Carney, your uh, partner in this, say that he wanted to see that the government was partly culpable. But how did he respond to the, it's 31 out of 32 counts he was proven guilty? James Bulger was extraordinarily content. I think the moment for him uh, came well before the verdict. It was the effort and the demonstration in court to help try to show as much truth as we could. The idea that the government has some uh, liability and accountability in what had happened over those decades was one of the most important objectives we had. One of the oddities of this was to see Stephen Davis and other members of families of victims embracing you and uh, Jay Carney today, and that here you were representing the man who killed their loved ones. What was that like for you, to have them almost siding with you, in a sense, not that they didn't want to see the, the government, you know, convict them, prosecute them and convict them, but they, 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 they really credit you with bringing out the government part of the corruption. Well, you know, we expect our criminals to commit crimes. That's what criminals do. We don't expect that from our law enforcement. And so having a very unique opportunity, Jake Carney and I had the uh, ability and uh, the invitation to do anything we could to try to help uh, find the truth and expose what the government had done. And the government had done a number of things that we don't expect from our government. They not only created victims, but they continued to victimize the victims by denying their responsibility. When we started this case, the effort was uh, at, the, at the most important part to help show the role the government played in this entire conspiracy. It was a very liberating experience as a defense attorney to be able to ask questions of witnesses, which in times could implicate our own client. And we did at many points, but also help other people. And I felt the presence of Patricia Donahue and the Donahue family and the Davises behind me every day. Um, I didn't always see them when my back was to them, but I felt their presence. And I knew uh, that what Jay and I, Carney, were doing had some import, not just for our client, but for the community, for particular victims, and also for the public. You eviscerated Stephen the Rifleman Fleming in cross-examination. And as a result of that, you could say that you were actually responsible for the no finding in the murder of Deborah Davis, even though everybody knows he was there. He was never there. He, he was behind it. He, for one reason or another, wanted her dead. And yet, as I said, the family is still saying, well, you know, they want to go further with this. They want to take it to a state court. But they're fine with that. Well, I take issue with the suggestion that he was there. And I take issue with the fact that you suggest that uh, they wanted him dead. The only, her dead. Or her dead, I'm sorry. The only person who has ever said that is Stephen Fleming. Mm -hmm. And certainly when a person that vile decides to kill his girlfriend because she has decided to, she had an interest in somebody else, uh, someone that vile with that type of reward isn't somebody who's reliable. Uh, so I absolutely uh, suggest that's not accurate and that's not true. I think quite the opposite. That being said, um, in protecting and defending James Bulger at trial, I think we demonstrated through the trial that we didn't pull any punches even if it incriminated James Bulger. Jay Carney and I, at every step, try to bring out the most reliable information. There were many witnesses which I asked uh, about not only the Deborah Davis murder, but also how the FBI was complicit in covering up Stephen Flemmy's misconduct um, by trying to hide the conversations and interviews with Olga Davis and Mickey Davis. So that was a concerted effort throughout the trial. And uh, sometimes the uh, public and people, victims like the Davis family, need somebody to stand up for them. And that's why we rely on prosecutors. That's why we rely on our government to do that. And when they fail uh, and someone else is there to take the void and we had an opportunity to do that, uh, for us that was very meaningful. I realize the judge wouldn't allow testimony in that you all wanted, you and Jay Carney, which was that 
the government offered Whitey Bulger and Stephen Lemmy and Stephen Weeks, to some extent, immunity um, from prosecution in order to turn evidence against uh, La Casa Nostra. But why not let your client testify? I know he said he wanted to in the beginning. Jay Carney said he would. Why not? The arrangement that James Bulger had with the federal government was very different than the arrangement that Stephen Flemmy had. James Bulger was never an informant for the federal government. He was never providing information, and I hope we dispelled that uh, through this trial. It's unfortunate that the general public doesn't see this type of trial on TV, and they can actually look at the detail and, and the evidence we that, that we help show, because unfortunately it still then becomes a matter of rumor and innuendo. James Bulger not only was prepared to take the stand, he expected to take the stand from day one, and it's what he wanted to do. There is a story, a sordid story, uh, that extends well beyond the Boston FBI to the Department of Justice to the highest ranks. And James Bulger was prepared to tell that story. It is a loss for everybody, for the jury, for the victim's families, for the community, for the public, not to have him take the stand. I expected he would have been the most convincing witness because he'd be the one witness who would not try to protect himself. I think that's reinforced by the approach Jay Carney and I took. But to have somebody take the stand just to give a confession, but not to give the entire story and protect the government, makes absolutely no sense. If the government had no fear of what James Bulger would say, there'd be no reason not to let him testify to his arrangement. If immunity was so absurd, then they simply could have dispelled it in front of the jury. So although the government continually suggests that they're disappointed he didn't testify, they try to silence him at every turn in this case. And it was an extraordinary loss because talk about the idea of closure. What better closure could you have than the person who could stand before the jury in the community and say exactly what happened? But fortunately, uh, I don't think this is the last word. It's the end of this trial, but there's perhaps other trials and there's other opportunities for James Bulger to have his voice heard. And this would have been the perfect forum, but the government wanted to deny that, and they effectively did. In the evidence file, there were informant cards issued to... Brian Halloran, Stephen Flemmy, others, among them, James Whitey Bulger. I think they just said James Bulger. If he wasn't an informant, why did he have a card? James Bulger didn't fill out a card and put it in a file to represent himself. It's ironic that the government says that John Conley, who was involved in such complicity and conspiracy and criminal activity, uh, and he cannot be believed, especially with all the detailed reports he gave. But then the reports uh, that may suggest that James Bulger gave information you should believe. There were a number of ways we tried to demonstrate to this jury. You should just clarify that because James Bulger was saying that he actually uh, paid them off. He gave them information, not the other way around. They were his paid informants. It is odd that a person who was supposedly an informant is paying so many thousands of dollars to law enforcement when they're supposed to be the informant. We showed a number of documents at this trial which showed specifically information that was attributed to James Bulger that was taken from other informant files. File after file and, and document after document came from other files that predated files and documents in James Bulger's file. The ping sheet and the protocol that you're supposed to go through with an informant was never followed. There was never a signature. There was never a contemporaneous photograph. Let me interrupt you, because why was this so important? That was never part of the trial. That was not an issue being decided at trial. Why was it so critical of you and your defense team to prove that he was not an informant? Well, it's a good point. It really wasn't so important to us, but remember, the government raised the issue. From the outset of this case, they wanted to insist that he was an informant. And any time we saw a fallacy or a fabrication, we try to check it and counter it and show that it wasn't true. Why do I suspect it was so important to the government? Well, part of it was because of reputation and pride and public relations. But think about uh, the consequence if he wasn't an informant. Here's a person who paid an extraordinary amount of members of the FBI uh, to get information. Inevitably, Washington, D.C. FBI was responsible for reviewing those files for determining whether or not things were viable. We had Mr. Fitzpatrick, who said he tried to shut him down, Mr. Davis, who said that the file was absolutely worthless, and Washington did nothing about it. If James Bulger was not an informant, as he was not, and simply paying the FBI, the accountability goes well beyond John Conley. And so the government certainly does want to accept responsibility and accountability for letting somebody who bribed their officials to exist. Since you brought up the issue of no cameras in the courtroom, which was incredibly frustrating to us in the news media and to the general public, tell us a little bit about working with Whitey Bulger. What was he like? How did you, did you end up liking him? Was he somebody who was very vocal? Did he speak up on his own behalf? How did he interact with you? Just anything. 
Uh, James Bulger uh, is an extraordinarily intelligent man, and he is uh, captivating. He's a historian. He was an excellent client. He educated. He gave guidance. He was a good listener. And Jay Carney and I had an extraordinary relationship with him. Uh, there were a number of things that uh, were introduced to me before we got to trial that helped me assist him. And uh, he was an excellent guide. I try to have an affinity for all my clients. Remember, when someone's charged, they're presumed innocent. And they come to you because they need help. And when you tell them, I'm going to treat you like a family member, you treat them like a family member. And if my brother is going to call me at 2 o'clock on a Friday night, I'm going to take the call. And James Bulge is no different than any other client that Jay and I had ever represented, uh, and no different than a family member once you represent him. He's 83. Was he completely cogent, lucid? Was he? Did he have, show any signs of illness or? None. Yeah, he's a captivating speaker. I think he would be absolutely mesmerizing to a jury. And if he does at some point have an interview, uh, I won't need to speak for him. He can <laughs> speak for himself. But at 83 years old, uh, he's equally, if not more, competent to speak on his behalf than I ever would be. 84 next month. All right, Hank yes. Brennan. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks for having me. It's been a crazy couple months for you. Pleasure. All right. Well, one person who took solid.